Uh, welcome again, everyone. I'm Chris Hendrickson, the 2021 president of the Architects League of Northern New Jersey. Hope everyone is doing well. Welcome. Uh, so tonight's presentation is Untapped New York's Chief Experience Officer Justin Rivers. He's going to be giving us the presentation tonight. Justin is Untapped New York's um, Chief Experience Officer. He is a writer and an interpretive historian whose work focuses on inspiring empowerment through storytelling in non-traditional settings. As a playwright, a tour guide, and an educator, his work is designed to help New Yorkers contextualize and rediscover their city by exploring the past, the present, and the future, um, and all about its diverse infrastructure. So tonight's presentation is on the Lost Crystal Palace of New York City's first World Fair. Um, one other thing, uh, Untapped New York is going to be offering a complimentary one month free membership to everyone who is on the uh, Zoom tonight. And Justin's gonna have some more information about that going forward. Um, and uh, so we're gonna let Justin speak and then give his presentation. And after that, we will um, uh, take a few questions uh, and do a little quite a Q and A at the end, so. Without any further ado, Justin, thank you so much for uh, being here with us tonight, and it's all yours. Oh, thanks, Chris. Uh, You're welcome. I am a, uh, first of all, I'm going to say uh, I am a son of northern New Jersey. I was born in Hackensack, raised there for uh, until I was six, and we moved to Ringwood. So you said Skyland, <laughs> yes. and I was like, holy cow, uh, my parents still live in Ringwood, um, and I, every time I go out every weekend, I take a walk with dad through Skyland. So oh, there you uh, go. it was so neat to hear. Yeah, it's like I never cool talked to anybody from New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's a beautiful spot. It's been uh, growing up there was one of the best things that ever happened. I grew up in the shadow of New York. Then I went to college at Fordham and then never came back to live in New Jersey. But I see my parents all the time. So, I, so I'm, far, I'm a, so far, I, so far. <laughs> my mother still says I hold, I have I still have my Jersey driver's license. She said, are you ever moving back? I said, we'll see. We'll see what happens. But um I have made, as you mentioned, uh, much of my career out of New York, New York history. And uh, that bio is all just a fancy way of saying, I like to tell stories, I like to tell stories around buildings. Uh, and I got involved in all of this work through writing a play about the demolition of the old Penn Station. Uh, and that's how I came to work with Untap Cities. I was a teacher and a writer by trade. And uh, this is how we got here. So the Crystal Palace, much like Penn Station became uh, a passion of mine because this is probably one of the first American seminal buildings. This was a really impressive piece of architecture that put not only New York on the map, but America on the map. So without further ado, I will start. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Hopefully everybody can see that. I used to see, hold on, try that again. There we go, all right. So uh, we at Untap New York do a series called um, the Lost New York series. And this was the first out of all of them. And uh, this was one of the aha moments for a lot of people because the Crystal Palace was built in 1854 and it didn't have a very long life. So it doesn't always get spoken about. And uh, what I'm gonna do is I am going to walk you through why the building was built, how the building was built, um, and what New York was like in the 1850s, because it was a real turning point year for New York City. And uh, for you guys being from Northern Jersey, also Northern Jersey as well, because uh, a lot of what happened in New York spilled over to Jersey eventually. So I broke it up into chapters uh, and chapter one is gonna be the Muse because there was a Crystal Palace in Hyde Park, London, uh, three years before there was a Crystal Palace in New York, and this was the inspiration for it. There was an exhibition of 1851, which was sort of uh, the beginning of what we would refer to as world's fairs or exhibitions. And the man who actually uh, designed the first Crystal Palace in London was a man named Sir Joseph Paxson. And when he designed it, he was not a sir yet, but designing it will make him knighted. Uh, and he was a simple English gardener and architect. He eventually becomes an MP, a member of parliament. And uh, <laughs> he has a very interesting, he loves to garden, he loves plants, and he actually is uh, the reason why we eat the type of banana that we eat in the Western world, because he introduces to us the Cavendish banana which is the most consumed still to this day. But uh, when he is tasked with building the first Crystal Palace in Hyde Park, he 
comes upon the right time to design such a building. The sheet glass method is now in full swing. It starts in the 1830s. So now you are able to create long interrupted pieces of glass. And then of course, cast iron was all the rage at this point. This is sort of the beginning of the cast iron craze, which a lot of people thought really uh, <laughs> erroneously, as we'll see by the end of this presentation, was fireproof and it was definitely not fireproof. Uh, but this was also a demonstration of highly modern industrial revolution building. No longer is it gonna take us uh, decades or centuries to build grand cathedrals like it, they did in Europe. Now we could put in grand massive public structures within weeks. And that's what the demonstration was so impressive in London. So the uh, Crystal Palace in London is a lot longer and by area larger than the New York Crystal Palace that we will speak about. And this was a floor plan for it, cast iron plate glass. Uh, and it was, it had 14,000 exhibitions inside of it or exhibitors inside it. So think uh, almost like going to a museum or think about if you had attended any of the World's Fairs in America, like the 64 World's Fair uh, here in New York you, instead of pavilions, you'd have these areas within the building that you would go and people would be showing you the latest technology from whatever country uh, was invited. Now, this structure was uh, 1,851 feet and it had a height at its top of 128 feet. And it was built within a matter of weeks. And that's what was most impressive about it. And this is a painting of the interior of the London Crystal Palace. Um, th this Crystal Palace will actually be taken down and moved. But what you could see they did here was they actually built it around Hyde Park. So these trees that are on this, I believe this is the Eastern nave, um, were actually Hyde Park trees. They just built the Crystal Palace around it. And that is another photo of, <laughs> of a built tree. This is an actual photo um, of that Crystal Palace. Now they move it to Sydenham Hill on the other side of London. And they put some additions on it, mainly those two towers that you see on each of the sides flanking it. They uh, sort of create these this dome ceiling that the original did not have. And this building will stand till I think it's 1936. Uh, and it, it's a, it was a popular staple of London life. And there's a Crystal Palace uh, train station still at Sydenham Hill for this building. But how does it get to America or how does this type of building come to New York City? Well, it's this man, and uh, maybe maybe you've heard of him, maybe you haven't, but he is the champion of the neck beard. Uh, his name is Horace Greeley. Horace Greeley, uh, I'm gonna tell this story through Horace Greeley's eyes because Horace Greeley um, was the publisher of one of the most popular newspapers at the time, the New York Tribune, which will go on living into the 20th century. And he really was a champion for uh, the underdog, the lower classes in New York and for equality in New York as well. And we'll come back to him every once in a while. I have a bunch of quotes from him because he will not only push for the building of the Crystal Palace and the American version of this World's Fair in eight, uh, 1854, he's also gonna push for the advancement of New York in general. Uh, and here is a cover of one of the seminal launched New York Tribune papers in 1841. It does launch in 1841. He is the head publisher. He is also one of its greatest writers. He was very prolific. He wrote a lot um, and he was <laughs> very wordy. But he says that it is, and quote, I have a quote, yet I think a strictly American fair might get up which would invent more originality of creation and design. So when he goes to London to actually report on the Crystal Palace, he says in a newspaper article, I think it's time for an American fair. Months later, while he's preparing essays in the Tribune, he says, quote, I do hope we may have a Crystal Palace of like proportions in New York within two years. It would be of inestimable worth as a study to our young architects, builders, and artisans. So he and a group of other influential New Yorkers push New York to build a Crystal Palace and host a World's Fair. But let's talk about New York at 1853. Very, very different city from the New York that we know today. Very different city from the New York we knew anytime in the 21st or 20th century. 
So as you can see here, this map is of the lower portion of Long Island. It is the map of the city of New York from 1853. And this is where New York basically is. Much further north of this map, you don't have much going on. Uh, don't be distracted, by the way, of Ward's Island and Randall's Island at the top of the screen over here. That's a cutaway. It's supposed to be the East River. It's not, it's not wrong. <laughs> they didn't put Ward's Island and Randall's Island in, in the Hudson. Um, so these were the major neighborhoods. Now, what you can see, 1811, there's something called the Commissioner's Plan. You probably know about this. Um, the Commissioner's Plan begins to grid over New York uh, as it was prescribed in 1811. And the grid basically gets its way up into the 30s at this point in uh, 1853. And then you've got all the morasses of the wards and neighborhoods down in lower Manhattan, south of Canal Street, even south of Houston Street with the village. Uh, just in case you are wondering, those red large numbers are actually fire bell designations. A uh, big problem in New York at the time was fire. Fire was always burning somewhere in New York, always consuming neighborhoods. So they had fire towers all over the city. And so for example, uh, if you see seven, that's sort of the seaport district down there right before Wall Street, that means if the bells rang seven times, that's where the fire was, go that way. And actually, as you can see here, uh, fire neighborhood number one, <laughs> one bell is where the Crystal Palace was put. Now, this is going to be really important because as you can see, they sort of began to grid over the 40s and the Crystal Palace is uh, where Bryant Park is today. So 42nd Street um, between 6th and uh, 5th Avenue where the uh, New York Public Library is. And it's, the, it's a reservoir. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we move on. It's part of the Croton Aqueduct System. The large reservoir is where the footprint of the library is today. And on the other side was a place called Reservoir Square, which was just a big open grassy lot. And it was uh, before that a potter's field. So they decide this is where they are going to put the Crystal Palace. And um, I'm not gonna go too much into the politics of uh, the exhibition company that forms. What I will say is it's a very American enterprise, unlike the British enterprise in 1851, which was uh, spearheaded by, by Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, both of whom were very much in favor of showing off uh, Britain's industry and the crown subsidized a lot of that exhibition and the building of the Crystal Palace, not so much in New York. In New York, it's private enterprise. It's rich New Yorkers who form a board and a private company who then build this uh, rent the land, build this building, which they are hoping when the exhibition is done, the city will actually buy from them and use as a public space. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. But in anticipation of this new Crystal Palace and potential World's Fair coming, people start writing books like this, The Stranger's Handbook of the City of New York. And actually, we're going to take a brief tour uh, through New York using this book in 1854. Here's what to see and how to see it. And that image on the cover here is of the Croton Reservoir. We're going to start south uh, and we'll start at Castle Garden. So probably one of the hottest spots in New York was Castle Garden in the 1850s. Castle Garden at this point was a, a big performance area. Um, it was also a beer garden, so there was a lot of drinking, there was a lot of carousing, there was a lot of performances. As a matter of fact, uh, this is a painting of Jenny Lind. Uh, Jenny Lind was one of the most popular uh, singers, opera singers of her time. She was brought to New York. She played 90 sold out concerts in Castle Garden. Now, before Castle Garden was a concert venue, uh, it was uh, an 1812 fortress that was built by uh, the military to fortify the harbor against the British coming before the War of 1812. But as some of you may know, if you like a history of this area, we built a couple of fortifications around the Hudson that never uh, shot uh, a fire in anger because the British didn't bother. They knew we were well fortified, mainly because of Castle Clinton, Castle Williams on Governor's Island, Fort Hamilton, and so on. But Castle Clinton was probably one of the, or Castle Garden as it is known afterwards, uh, when it is turned over to entertainment and public use, uh, was one of the most popular spots in New York at the time. 
I love this picture because this is Battery Park. This is one of the earliest known daguerreotypes taken of New York City. Um, this would be standing right outside of Castle Garden and looking at what looks like almost this really depressing pit, <laughs> which will become part of the Battery Park that we know today. And that church spire in the background is Trinity on uh, Wall Street and Broadway. And that is the tallest building in New York at the time. And uh, it will be eclipsed by one of the buildings we will be talking about today. By the way, this picture was taken by French artist and then photographer Victor Prevost, uh, who was one of the early experimenters in um, very early photography, uh, xenotype and daguerreotype. He comes to New York uh, with the idea of opening a studio and making his riches selling daguerreotypes and photographs, but he doesn't quite make it. So he ends up becoming a public school physics teacher, <laughs> which I kind of love. So another popular spot in one of 18 parks that were in Manhattan at the time is Bowling Green. This is park number one. And this is a, a picture postcard of uh, Bowling Green in 1850. So again, another very ancient photograph of New York. And you can see the carriages lined up ready for people. Uh, they were not omnibuses, obviously, but this was a private cab. And you could see in the writing uh, when Jenny Lind sang in New York. So just what I was talking about around this time, uh, it was probably one of the biggest things to happen to New York since George Washington was inaugurated. Another place to stop if you're visiting the fair and want to go to the palace, but you want to do something else is to go to Matthew Brady's Daguerreotype uh, studio. And in this, you will see that St. Paul's in the background on the street on Broadway, which is still there right across from City Hall Park. And two buildings down is Brady's. Now, Matthew Brady, a lot of us know for taking that very iconic photo of a young Abraham Lincoln before he is president. As a matter of fact, Abraham Lincoln, when he comes to New York to speak at Cooper Union, will get off of the steamboat on Wall Street and walk right up to uh, Brady's Daguerreotype studio to get his picture taken before he goes to speak. And this is where the studio was. This is actually a sketch, it's not a photograph, but it's a sketch of people looking in Brady's studio. It was huge, it was multiple floors and people came just to look at the photographs, um, not even to buy, but people did also buy as well. And then they would purchase uh, photography for themselves and their families. And uh, Brady said, you know, it's much cheaper than getting your, uh, your image painted. So he tried to be uh, very um, competitive in that way with artists. And he was a hit. He really is the one we remember for early photography. And actually, this is a staff photo of the New York Tribune uh, first staff. And Brady is sitting, if you could see my cursor, right there next to a very young Horace Greeley. And so these are sort of the men who are running New York at the time. Um, the height of technology, the height of press, um, and they are making their way in the world. Now, the second most popular spot in New York, or some would say with the first, was Barnum's Museum. Now, we're moving up north on Broadway. And uh, Barnum's Museum at its peak, so this uh, building was built in 1841 and it will burn in 1865. And in the course of its time, it will actually see more customers than there were people in America. So 38 million people would come. They would pay uh, 25 cents for admission into this museum. And P.T. Barnum, who the name you may recognize from Barnum and Bailey Circus, was a showman, a huckster, uh, a real smooth talker, and he would have all of these different exhibitions inside, all of which, of course, were fake or done up very much for um, sensational viewing, and people loved it. I love this painting. This is an aerial view uh, across from St. Paul's, and this is on Ann Street and Broadway. It's uh, an office building now with the Zaras <laughs> on, the, <laughs> on the street level. But uh, one of his biggest hits was the Fiji mermaid. So he actually had a woman looking like a half of a fish uh, in what looked like something like a tank. Um, you'll also see Egyptian mummies. Uh, these were, again, mostly staged or doctored up images. But he actually did have real genuine things like this whale. He had a beluga whale in a tank, which people could come and see. And actually, the uh, they he fed water in from the Hudson. He ran a line all the way from the Hudson into the museum to keep the beluga whale alive. 
Unfortunately, the museum will burn uh, in 1865 and that beluga whale will be boiled. Sorry, whale. Uh, now they built hotels in anticipation for this World's Fair. They decided it's time to uh, make New York more of a tourist city before 1854. There is no such thing really as tourism in New York. New York is a port city. If you lived here, you were uh, an immigrant or you were working here, uh, you were in business. Uh, if you came here, you were probably here because you were transferring goods or getting goods or leaving New York uh, to travel the world with goods. This was not like we know New York, you were not coming to visit. Now, with this Crystal Palace being built and this World's Fair, you were coming to New York to visit. So we had to build some hotels. This was one of them. The St. Nicholas Hotel was built in 1850. The other was called the Metropolitan. Um, the St. Nicholas Hotel, this was at Broom Street and Broadway, uh, and it can accommodate 800 guests, which was, again, a very large building for its time. And uh, one of its furnishings that they had plugged was central heating which was rare at that time. It was central heating through pipes, not through stoves. If you went a little further north, there was the Metropolitan Hotel, which was actually a row of stately brownstones uh, just north of St. Nicholas. It was a whole block, Broadway and Crosby, between Crosby and Prince Streets. Uh, and it had uh, 100 suites in it. And this building was more for the hoi polloi, as they like to say. This was this because it was 100 suites. This catered for people who wanted multiple rooms, multiple bedrooms, parlors and the like while they were in New York. And again, if you were coming, you probably were not coming for, you know, two days or a long weekend. When you traveled at this time, you stayed for a while. You had to because it took so long to get around. If going a little further north, another popular entertainment spot was Niblo's Garden. I don't know if there are any musical uh, theater fans here tonight, but uh, hello, Dolly. Um, there's famous scenes in something called the Harmonia Gardens. Well, Niblo's Garden was sort of uh, modeled after that. And Niblo's Garden was a uh, cross between a restaurant, a very grand, large restaurant, and then also a performance space. And here you can see this was the stage at Niblo's Garden. They often performed opera here. And uh, it was considered to be the most impressive entertainment complex and fine dining. Uh, so it was a combination of both. As a matter of fact, when they opened the, uh, had their big ceremony to open the Crystal Palace in July of 1854, they will have the reception at Niblo's. They will not have it at the Crystal Palace. And President Franklin Pierce uh, and all of the heads of state would come here to celebrate. And then you have the Hippodrome. And uh, there was uh, two versions of the Hippodrome, a Hippodrome that was uh, up on in the 40s until the 1950s, I believe. But this was the first Hippodrome. It was sort of a castelline structure with almost like a circus tent uh, built over it. And this was a very large and impressive structure. What I'm doing is I'm showing you very large, uh, popular structures in New York. And then you're going to see basically how the Crystal Palace creams all of them <laughs> when, it, when it's built. Um, and this was right uh, off of Madison Square. It was elliptical, 700 foot circumference, and it covered almost an entire city block. Um, it was used throughout the year, but not so popular in the winter because those tents couldn't keep things as warm as people would like them to. But you could go here to see animal acts, gladiator battles, uh, chariot races, something almost like ancient Rome, um, and a lot of fun for New Yorkers at the time. And then of course, the real hit for most of the commoners who were coming to New York were the dance hall, uh, halls, the bars, and the taverns. Um, their, a whole new slate of bars would open all along Broadway uh, near where the Crystal Palace will be built to accommodate all of the people who are going to come and who are going to drink and who are going to revel rouse at night when they're coming to visit the palace. Now, how do you get to the palace? Um, we did not have the subway. We didn't even have elevated train at the time. Uh, we had the Sixth Avenue Railroad and the Sixth Avenue Railroad was actually a horse-drawn railroad uh, that used tracks built into the street. So the horses would pull the cars up uh, via track using horses and then it would make stops through uh, and all throughout Manhattan. But mainly there were different railroads for different areas. Uh, Sixth Avenue ran down the middle spine of Manhattan. And this would have been the way 
if you wanted a cheap way to get around Manhattan during the World's Fair to get to the palace, you'd do this because this was, I believe it was five cents, uh, three and a half, sorry, three and a half cents per person as opposed to the 12 cents if you took an omnibus. Now an omnibus was like a large stagecoach which they just pack with people uh, and the stagecoach would just travel throughout the city streets and drop you off where you needed to go. And then of course you had pedicabs, which were very, very expensive. So if you wanted to move around public transportation, this was the way to do it. And here's a uh, illustration of the stop right outside of the Crystal Palace at 6th Avenue uh, and 42nd Street, where you could see people just teeming all around and out of this um, railroad car. And of course, again, not the railroad we know because uh, it's, it's a horse powered. <laughs> No steam, no electric, really interesting. But now the main event, of course, let's talk about the building. So this was when it was built, said by many to be the greatest building in America. It was when it was completed, the largest building in this hemisphere, uh, and it'll only have a four year life. It will not live very long. And this is what the plot of land that it was built on looked like. This uh, area in 1686 was actually designated as public property by the colonial governor, uh, Thomas Dungan. Uh, and a couple of famous revolutionary battles will be fought somewhere around here as uh, George Washington is escaping out of Manhattan as he crosses over from Brooklyn uh, in 1776. And then later uh, the grid system when it's laid out um, this becomes a potter's field. So they sort of leave it alone. They, they put it in the grid, but they don't build on it. They don't sell land on top of it. Uh, and in 1822, it comes under the jurisdiction of New York City, who will use it as a potter's field until 1840, when the construction of the Croton Reservoir is, uh, has begun. And they kind of figured smartly, probably not a good idea to bury bodies right next to our fresh drinking water, because that will actually get New York into a lot of trouble in its past. Uh, New York got most of its fresh drinking water from a pond, uh, which is now at Foley Square, where the courts are in Lower Manhattan, called the Collect Pond. And because of tanneries and industry and blacksmiths and burying people along um, the northern edge of the city by the Collect Pond, we have awful cholera epidemics in New York um, that wipe out the city's population, which is why uh, in the 1840s, by 1842, the Croton Reservoir runs a 30 mile line from fresh drinking water in upstate New York, Westchester County, down to New York. And this um, Egyptian revival, really impressive looking structure uh, was one of the largest buildings in New York at the time. And it held 20 million gallons of water really, really impressive. And this is what it looked like later on in its life. Uh, this was designed by James Renwick. Uh, you may have heard his name. James Renwick designed St. Patrick's Cathedral. He also designed most of the buildings, uh, the older buildings on Governor's Island, uh, Grace Church and the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, DC. Um, he loved Egyptian revival and most of the stuff in New York that he built didn't have it but uh, this, this was one of his greatest examples. And uh, it was almost like a park because people would promenade along the walkway of the top of this reservoir. This reservoir will also be a bane in the existence of the architects of the Crystal Palace, which I'll tell you about in a second. But what's there today where the reservoir is? Well, this is a Google Earth uh, shot or Google Maps shot of that corner. It is the New York Public Library. And if you go into the New York Public Library and go downstairs, you can see old foundation walls from the Croton Reservoir built into the structure. Really interesting. So when they put together the company to uh, house what's going to be called the Exhibition of the Industry of All Nations, which is just a fancy way of saying World's Fair, um, they have to put out a contest for who the architects will be to build the Crystal Palace. And they see many, but these two men actually get the job. So Georg Christensen and Charles Gildemeister, so Georg is the one on the left side, uh, Charles is the one on the right side. Uh, they team up, they were both immigrants, one was from Germany and one was from Denmark. And uh, they both had landed in New York pretty mid-career as architects and uh, teamed up 
and decided they were going to put their uh, throw their hat in for the bid and they won the design. So their idea was and their challenge was there was no way you could build a crystal palace as large by area as the one in Hyde Park because New York's grid system basically girdled it in to a square. So what are you going to do to make this building impressive? Well, this decision will make um, absolute monumental history in New York because it's what we will end up doing evermore. They build up. Uh, they say, well, we can use the footprint that we've got, but because of that reservoir across the street and because we've only got this you know, five acre plot here, we're gonna build up and we're gonna make a really impressive dome that's gonna blow the um, Hyde Park dome out of the water and the height of this is going to impress. And it did, it, it very much did. And here are uh, artful renderings of the design. They did a Greek cross uh, and it covered mainly most of the five acre plot that was Reservoir Square. And it was two levels and they actually had initially designed a basement, but they would cut the full basement in um, as they were building it to cut costs, which will actually be one of the reasons why we might lose it. Or so they say. But the dome is really the star of the show. The dome itself, after sitting on top of the two levels of the building is 100 feet high. So it does eclipse the Crystal Palace height and it is an absolutely gorgeous artful uh, lattice structure. And it is sort of the star of the show whenever it's written about. So uh, construction begins in the spring of 1853. And it is quickly, quickly, they clear the land off and they start building and it becomes the show in town. As you can see, these are people actually standing on the promenades on top of the Croton Reservoir, watching them build the Crystal Palace. And then here you can see this is sort of mid build, but I want you to notice on the left side of the screen, this structure going up. Because this structure is almost just as important as the Crystal Palace in its legacy that it will leave behind, but it was never invited and it was, it was never part of the World's Fair, but we'll talk about it. It was called the Ladding Observatory. And I'm actually gonna give a whole little uh, uh, chapter to it. And here again, from the perspective of the Croton Reservoir are people watching um, the men build the dome. And actually there's a really great quote from Greeley himself who, uh, painstakingly um, recorded, almost like he was videoing the process of building this building. Uh, he said, uh, quote, workmen perched like autumnal pigeons on leafy boughs, clustered within and without the vast edifice, and the magic web of improvement each day proceeded. Scores of men seemingly no larger than mice hung pendant from the lofty and magnificent dome, coating its inner surface with the destined decorations. So what they will do is they'll actually um, cap this dome, not with glass, but with tin. As you can see here, there will be glass windows, very pretty, almost like rose windows, but they'll put tin on, the mo on most of it to help protect it and keep the shape of the dome. And this is, a, a, there are very few actual photographs of the uh, Crystal Palace, but this is another one by Victor Prevost, who we saw the Battery Park picture before. And again, you can see the Ladding Observatory next door, which is going to become one of the tallest structures in the world. And actually, well, it is already because it's finished in that picture. And this is the scene from Sixth Avenue uh, as they are wrapping up building the Crystal Palace. And this is what that scene looks like today. Uh, Brian Park bustling. And one of the neat things is you can, um, because there's no building, it's just park space, you can sort of imagine what the Crystal Palace may have looked like because there's that open air there. And uh, then basically what happens is once the palace is finished and the fair is going to be opened um, in 1854, they're behind schedule. There's a lot of animosity between the architects and the company. Uh, they make a lot of cuts on certain things that the architects planned, like a deeper basement. Uh, and they actually get into a huge fight and the architects aren't even invited onto the dais um, opening day. They're forced to sit in 
the, the audience with everybody else and they're not even mentioned, but they will actually be redeemed because uh, it's a world's fair and they almost like a county fair, they award medals for all of the categories of exhibitions and um, uh, the architects will win the silver medal of the entire world's fair for the building itself. Now, I, this shot not only shows what the Crystal Palace looked like in real life, but also I just want to demonstrate to you that 42nd Street between 5th and 6th Avenue is not what we think 42nd Street between 5th and 6th Avenue is today. Um, this was considered to be a shantytown. And there was very little to nil development up here. So when it was decided to put the Crystal Palace up here, a lot of the organizers were not very happy about it because this is literally considered the boondocks. But the Crystal Palace and the World's Fair being where it is will actually improve and build up this neighborhood. Now, once the building is finished, it was supposed to be finished in May. Uh, they won't open it up until July. Uh, and when they open it up in July, they're still building the building and all of the exhibitors are not there yet, but they open the fair up, I believe it's July 14th. And uh, so the marvels begin. Now, there are a couple of books that you can read to will tell you exactly to the measurement where the tables are, what was at the table, uh, who was manning the table, what country represented it and what they have. And this is one of them. This is the guidebook for the exhibition of the industry of all nations. Um, and of course you can see here, this opening page just tells you the officers of the company that built the Crystal Palace and organized the fair, their board of directors, their executive department, all very bully, mutton chopped, mustachy, cigar smoking men. Um, a bunch of whom will be lost to time, but there are a couple that you may, the Livingstons, which you see under the board of directors, uh, definitely a big part of New York history. And of course, August Belmont, Alexander Hamilton Jr., George Shiler, these are all big New York families. Uh, August Belmont's son, August Belmont Jr., will build uh, the first subway in New York, the Interborough Rapid Transit, and St. John the Divine. Not himself, he'll form companies to do it, but. Horace Greeley wrote this book, which was Art and Industry, an exhibition at the Crystal Palace. And he, again, like he is known to do, painstakingly describes every inch. It's 419 pages long. And in doing research for this uh, and uh, other projects I've used the Crystal Palace in, I've, I've read a, a good deal of it, not all of it. It's really dense, but it's good because you feel like you are right there. And it's interesting because what Greeley is saying, this is a treatise for saying art should not be for these rich robber barons who are building these giant mansions on Fifth Avenue, which will still become a trend in the years to follow after the Crystal Palace. Art should be put in public exhibition for everybody to enjoy. And then we can improve you know, the intellect and the lives of the common worker, the lower classes, because What's going on in New York at this time is the lower classes and the upper classes are clashing and sometimes violently because of the conditions that uh, they're living in in New York. And he said, this exhibition and this building will be a beacon to all of those people to know that there's something that can improve their lives and something for them to sort of step out of their lives and aspire to. And this is a sketching of the opening day of the fair, July 14th, uh, 1853. And uh, Franklin Pierce uh, will open the World's Fair, much like presidents do at World's Fairs in their countries. And he says, quote, everything around us reminds us that we live in a utilitarian age where science, instead of being locked up for the admiration of the world, has become tributary to the arts, manufacturers, architecture, and all that goes to promote our domestic comforts and our universal prosperity, close quote. These World's Fairs become a way for countries to show off what industrialization is doing um, mass production is doing, and of course, show off just how advanced they are. And America, definitely the young kid on the stage, had a lot to prove and wanted to prove so. But then go to the nitty gritty. I love this. What was invented? The turnstile. Like, so when you entered, you entered from Sixth Avenue, you went up to a ticket office, uh, and uh, season ticket owners went through one of these turnstiles and uh, daily ticket holders went through the other turnstile and the turnstile counted 
exactly how many of each passed through so that they could keep very accurate records of who came in and who came out. And of course, here is an image of the ticket office. And so it was 50 cents for a daily ticket and it was $10 for a seasonal ticket. And the season would go from July uh, to late October with the idea that hopefully there would be a second season, although there was no um, uh, promise of that. And here is a copy of the season ticket. As you can see, this is season ticket number 12342. And uh, there it is for uh, November. Uh, I'm sorry, it actually went until November, obviously, because the ticket tells you that. <laughs> the uh, for When the Crystal Palace's first season opens, there is no heating. There's barely any gas lighting in there. So you had a very short season, July to they pushed it to November. But after that, it would get too cold and you could only do programming in during the day. Uh, there was no way to really light the place up. They will change that a couple of years later, which may be part of its demise. And here you can see the divisions of classes of all of the things that you would be able to see at the World's Fair. Um, very, very long lofty titles, but they were broken up into categories so they could be awarded later on at the end of the fair. Um, and you could see uh, fabrics, dyed and painted fabrics. There's a lot of art, iron and brass and glassware, hardware, lamps, fine arts. Um, it's almost like going to a very, very glorified mall from all over the world showing you all of their wares. Uh, and this is where you can find each of the uh, stalls or exhibitions on both of the floors to find all of these guys. Just a couple of things that I will highlight. Oh, this is very interesting, by the way. So you see this is uh, the ground floor plan of the Crystal Palace. And you'll notice at each of the corners in the center between the naves, there are grand staircases that wrap up to the upstairs. But then you're also going to see along, there's a building uh, along the back end, and this is sort of the east end of the building that holds, you'll see it says machine arcade, uh, arcade at the top. And then you'll see gentlemen's saloon and ladies saloon. But I want you to notice on the diagonals here on the corners, these structures, guess what those are? They're bathrooms. And this was one of the first times public spaces ever had bathrooms inside. Uh, and they called them refreshment stations. <laughs> um, really uh, important. Of course, we can't imagine what it would be like without them. Uh, and here is, now there are many images, many sketches of what it would look like to be inside. Uh, that is a statue of George Washington on the horse. It is the center statue, of course, George Washington, a pivotal figure in America. Uh, we wanted to show off the father of our country and that statue was absolutely hated by everybody. And I'll tell you why in a second. Um, and here's another view. Uh, and then what they did was the Illustrated News, which is where most of these are coming from. The Illustrated News was actually a P.T. Barnum publication. He realized a lot of people couldn't read. So he had artists basically as reporters going out and sketching all of this stuff. And the sketches were a big part of the newspapers at the time. And this is what uh, he had a very, very long, almost like Bayou tapestry of each of the countries and what they were exhibiting at the fair. One of the biggest hits was the Singer Sewing Machine Company. So 10 sewing machine companies would exhibit, but Isaac Singer's drew the most attention. He patented it in 1851. It could do 200 stitches a minute compared to 40 for any given human seamstress. Uh, and it had a foot pedal, which was sort of all of the rage. And it is why he will win the silver medal in that category. And of course, we still know Singer Sewing Machines today. Also, Cult. Samuel Colt, who was awarded the silver medal in his category, uh, which was Naval Architecture, Military Engineering, Ordnance, Armor, and Accoutrements. <laughs> uh, and he won for a superior workmanship and finish of his firearms, which were also artfully displayed, as you can see. People really loved this exhibit because of how beautiful the display was made of uh, the guns and the shield there. And here's an actual picture of a Colt revolver that was shown at the Crystal Palace at the World's Fair. And I believe this is at the city of the Museum of New York. 
and probably one of the most important things to debut at the World's Fair, especially when you talk about building in New York, but just building in general, um, Samuel Otis. Uh, Otis himself uh, will be on hand. That's a picture of him demonstrating his safety elevator. And the safety elevator is designed so that it has a brake that if in case the elevator breaks from its uh, conveyors that you can stop it from plummeting and of course severely hurting or killing the people who are on the elevator itself. And this will revolutionize how we can build because in a building that was the tallest or one of the tallest because the observatory was next door was and largest in the country, uh, he is going to observe how we can uh, just demonstrate, sorry, how we can build buildings much, much larger. Uh, and because of him, we will. He would go on to install his first passenger elevator uh, in the Hogwout and Company department store at 488 Broadway. And of course, then we get the skyscraper boom. And here's one of the few pictures I could find actual daguerreotypes of the inside of the World's Fair in the Crystal Palace. And actually, this is, I think this is after the 1854 season because the Washington um, sculpture was moved out of the center because people hated it. And we'll tell you why right now. Uh, so this was a uh, Italian sculptor, Carlo Marchetti. He uh, designed this, uh, it's supposed to be the stately president um, on horse, but people hated it. As a matter of fact, I have some uh, interesting quotes. They said, the Tribune said, quote, it is bad. Uh, it is beneath mediocrity, a colossal abortion, a bag of meal on horseback. <laughs> um, people hated it. I think uh, they moved it the next season. And then the New York Times, which by the way, is a very young paper at this time, uh, 1851, it's founded. They're writing about this in 1855. They say, quote, no one is sorry uh, that it has been moved. An impossible horse best ridden by an impassive clod. Uh, it was not an agreeable object, close quote. I think the problem was uh, we did not like statues that did not portray Washington as larger than life. And the, the, uh, the geometry of this didn't work. Uh, he looked like he's sort of leaning back. The horse just looks ridiculous. People absolutely hated it. But another statue that was introduced at the World's Fair, which made quite a big splash, was from Hiram Powers, who was an American sculptor who had moved off to London. Uh, and he uh, composed this, which is supposed to be a young woman who has been sold into Turkish, a Christian woman, sold into a Turkish harem into slavery. Uh, and of course, what you see is that she is naked. And this is one of the first times a naked woman will actually be presented in public in America. And there was obviously a big to do about all of this, but it was decided that it was uh, fine because she was supposed to be an image of piety. Uh, even though she was sold into slavery, um, there are certain things like her stature and of course how she's covering herself up sort of genteely um, that is representative of the Christian faith. It was very popular. Many, many people wanted to see it. It traveled the world. Um, you can put the pieces together as to probably why it was so popular, but I, I don't think it was for the morality. But <laughs> uh, And then of course, uh, one of the most popular uh, sculptures was the horse. And that is supposed to be depicting a uh, Indian and as Indian, uh, American Indian, it's from uh, French sculptor Autain, Auguste Louis Marie Autain. Uh, and it's representing an Indian shooting an arrow into the throat of a snake. So it was very kinetic. And I think what people liked about it was just how action packed this sculpture was. But if you notice right behind it, my, I love lighthouses, that you go closer, that is actually a Fresnel from the Cape Hatteras lighthouse. Also uh, displayed as some of the biggest uh, technology, newest technology at the time. And let's talk about another building besides the Crystal Palace that never gets talked about, but very important um, for what it begins is the Ladding Observatory. Now the Ladding Observatory was not part of the World's Fair, but Warren Ladding, a huckster and local inventor, uh, just decided to start a private enterprise where he was going to build an observation tower. 
And he does. Um, and it is about 28 stories high. It is the tallest building, I think, in the world. It's definitely the tallest building in America at the time. I don't know if it's taller, uh, tallest in the world, uh, but it was 75 feet in diameter. It tapers only up to about six feet right at the tippy top. No elevator, by the way. You had to climb those stairs all with your feet. Uh, but there were observatories uh, on your way up that you could stop. There was even a place like a snack bar uh, in the middle that you could stop, get some refreshments, of course, buy some souvenirs, and then go all the way to the top if you wanted to. Um, oh, no, it's right here. Sorry. In the, uh, the Great Pyramid of Giza was the only taller building at the time. Very, very impressive, but people said it's ugly as sin. Obviously, it was more utilitarian than anything else. And of course, in the base of the building, what you had were a saloon, again, multiple places to stop and spend money. That's all Warren Ladding wanted you to do. You could get ice cream in the saloon, so kids could come. You could get breakfast, dinner, as you could see, tea from here. Um, and it was all about getting people to go to the top to see as high as they had ever be and probably ever will be in their lives at the time. Uh, and it was a huge, huge hit. Uh, they basically said you could see to New Jersey, you could see clear across over into the ocean, out to Long Island. Um, this was the clearest view you'd ever have. Uh, I love, uh, there were many sketching representations done of the observatory itself. And this is a souvenir bottle that you could buy at the refreshment stand um, of the observatory, which had the Crystal Palace on it. So the idea was Ladding knew why you were there. You were there to go to the Crystal Palace, but of course, get a souvenir bottle, take it home. This is the beginning of uh, tourism in New York and of course, uh, tourist consumption in New York. And here was a wood graving. It was William uh, Wellstead's engraving from 1855 called From the Ladding Observatory. And this was the view that you had from the Ladding. And of course, again, the highest most people had been at the time. And you can see just how sparse development is up at this part of Manhattan. And of course, look out to Long Island. Brooklyn is just basically a city uh, at the foot by the river. And uh, New Jersey looks pretty quiet too on the river as well. But unfortunately, conflagration will take both buildings. Um, conflagration, <laughs> the term that was always used in the newspapers at the time to describe massive fires which swallow these buildings. The first building to burn will be the Ladding Observatory. It was late one night in uh, 1856, August of 1856, a fire broke out in one of the buildings uh, next door to the observatory. They think it was sort of like a work shed for the Sixth Avenue Railroad. There was a lot of grease involved. Um, it was next to a Cooper shop. So the Cooper shop goes up. And it's just, again, um, buildings and building fires in New York, once they start, it's hard for them to stop. There is no official fire department yet. The fire department is sort of just getting, um, or the FDNY is just sort of starting. Um, it will not become an official city institution for a while. So you have volunteer groups, again, uh, ringing those bells. Most of the time they would come out too late, depending on where they were to stop the fire and they were never really equipped, as you can see in this picture by those small little trucks with the pumps to put out large fires, especially with these large buildings. Uh, and the tower is consumed very, very quickly within about two hours it's absolute rubble on the ground. And here's a, um, I believe this is from the Times, this article, which talks about, again, the great conflagration, the destruction of the Ladding Observatory, a very destructive conflagration, which takes out $150,000 worth of property. But luckily, Crystal Palace was saved. Um, there was a little bit of damage uh, some of the debris from the observatory does fall on, break some of the glass, but it's uh, totally doable to save the Crystal Palace that is not destroyed. And actually the Crystal Palace has a slightly tarnished um, image after the fair because the owners of the building, again, built it 
and intended for the city to buy it from them, to use it as a public space. The city has no interest in it. It sits there for a while uh, and just rots for a couple of years. But uh, they actually turn over the World's Fair to P.T. Barnum. He becomes the president for a year. P.T. Barnum tries to reintroduce a schnazzier, uh, showier World's Fair for the second season. It's an abysmal disaster. They don't make a lot of money. And the building actually sits fallow for a couple of years before they decide uh, in 1850, I think it's like 1857, that they can start renting it out for events, big events. But what they have to do first is gear it for food and lights. And so they run a whole ton of gas lines throughout this building to provide gas lighting and gas for cooking in a kitchen area in the basement. And actually what you're seeing here is the last event ever to take place in the Crystal Palace, a huge event, September 1st, 1858. It celebrates the transatlantic telegraph cable being finished, connecting the new world to England in two minutes. And of course that electric uh, telegraph can communicate to Europe very, very quickly. Uh, the first message sent from Queen Victoria to America and um, it was a huge, huge event, as you can see here, thousands of people coming in. They also had a couple of days before this, a big fundraising event where they served a very large lavish dinner. And um, again, the building was not originally designed for gas lines. Uh, they used soft gas lines. This is probably what's gonna be the problem. Although they say it is a mystery as to why the building burned I think it's probably a little less of a mystery. Um, some people thought that it was arson to because the city didn't want the building and nobody really wanted to take care of it, that somebody one uh, day just decided to light the thing on fire. They had caught a couple of kids running away from the building laughing. Um, but most likely what was reported was in the evening, right around five o'clock, they were having an exhibition, as a matter of fact. Another group was uh, doing an exhibition of the sciences and industry on a smaller scale than the World's Fair. And somebody had said they were going down to the basement to turn the gas on. And somebody called out, gas is on. Two minutes later, somebody shouted fire. So my assumption is, and again, nobody knows for sure, but most likely one of the gas lines most likely broke and fire was caught and the building burns. And actually, I'm going to read to you a really description, a really great description of how the building burns, which was uh, written by Edward G. Burroughs, who wrote, if you're interested in reading more, it's a really great, it's a little book, you could read it in like two days. It's called The Finest Building in America. And um, he writes really well about the fire and of course, the building in general. Uh, but this is how it would have happened. Several hundred cast iron columns would begin to soften in the intense heat lose structural integrity and spring away from the wrought iron girders they were attached to. A possible reason for the odd sounds reported by some witnesses of the blaze. Unsupported, the galleries and their exhibits would then collapse onto the floor, splintering joists and adding fuel to the fire. Only minutes would elapse before the iron panels and frames of the facade began to buckle and the growing conflagration consumed the wooden sashes that held the windows. A shower of broken melted glass would then have fallen on anyone still in the building. There was no one, as we know, after the great dome itself fell with a loud crash shortly thereafter, the comparative silence must have seemed eerie. So basically the fire starts from the bottom, most likely from the basement. It sort of creates an oven, the cast iron melts and the floors and the supports from the second floor all collapse, everything in it goes down with it. And then of course the dome is the last to go. And that is an illustrated image of the day after people picking through the wreckage uh, to figure out if they could save anything or if there was anything worth pillaging. As you can see, Croton Reservoir in the background. Another image. And of course in very true New York style, <laughs> what happens is people who are actually exhibiting uh, pull pieces of the wreckage out and start selling them uh, as, you know, wreckage of the world's, uh, the, uh, the Crystal Palace and um, very enterprising people, obviously. And as I had said, uh, they loved to commemorate medals and coins. And this was a, uh, a coin that was commemorated for the fire of 
the Crystal Palace. And there was also coins min uh, minted for each of the fair seasons and then every one of the uh, awards that were given out during the fair. But this is an actual coin. Uh, and as you can see, it says destroyed by fire October 5th, 1858 in 40 minutes. Although most people say it actually just took 30. It was completely burned to the ground in a half an hour. Now, um, this is an image of the Crystal Palace in London, in Sydenham, uh, burning in 1936, the end of November. Um, they had run electric, and apparently something had gone on in an office that caught fire, a waste paper basket caught fire. And so a small waste paper basket, that whole thing went up. And uh, I think 89 fire engines, 400 uh, firemen arrived, uh, and this bur building built, uh, burned in hours, not minutes. It took a while. Now, the architectural legacy left behind from the Crystal Palace uh, is great. There is a lot of buildings that you could sort of trace back to this idea of the palace. You may notice between there that is the Trilon and Parisphere of the 1939 and 40 World's Fair is held in Flushing Meadow, Corona Park. But here is, I love this, a picture of uh, a piece of glass that was sold after the fire as a memento of the Crystal Palace. That's how thick the glass was of the Crystal Palace. And this is uh, at, again at the Museum of the City of New York. And what happens to Reservoir Square? Well, they clear it off and William Cullen Bryant says that New York needs more park space. You have to remember, this is literally right before Central Park. New York is very crowded, and he pushes for a park which will eventually bear his name, which is still there today. Bryant Park, Bryant park has evolved throughout the years. Uh, it is not the park that was built right after uh, the Crystal Palace. Uh, Bryant Park will actually be lifted up in the 1930s. It'll be raised um, above street level by Robert Moses, but Bryant Park is named after William Colin Bryant, who pushed for the park space. Now, it is Gustav Eiffel who actually climbed to the top of the Ladding Observatory, who decided when he was going to throw his hand in for um, the 1886 World's Fair, uh, 1889, I'm sorry, uh, Paris Exhibition, um, he was directly, and had actually said this, inspired by the Ladding Observatory. And of course, a building even small children can identify is inspired by a building that very few people knew existed, the Ladding uh, Observatory. And I always think that is a neat little fact. Uh, interestingly enough, when the Eiffel Tower was uh, debuted, uh, people hated it. And of course, we can't imagine a world without it, but Ain't that the way sometimes. And you'll also notice at the exhibition site in Paris, look at how all of those buildings also look in some way like versions of the Crystal Palace themselves. Uh, I'm a big Penn Station guy. That's how I started. I think I started this talk out with, uh, with that. But uh, McKim Eden White, who designed Pennsylvania Station, you can't help but notice the similarities in the concourse area train shed. Um, as a matter of fact, the uh, World's Fair company was trying to convince the city to use the Crystal Palace as a hub for rail. They didn't want to. It would have been a very different city, of course, a couple of uh, avenues down from Bryant Park is Grand Central Terminal. And uh, Vanderbilt will put his depot, it's a depot first, on that plot in the 1870s, so about uh, 20 years later. But what's interesting, I love this. Uh, I also do a World's Fair tour, so I love the World's Fair at Flushing Meadow. I found this and never even dawned on me how the Trilon and Parisphere of the 1939 World's Fair are actually an homage to the Lighting Observatory and the dome of the um, Crystal Palace. And here they are. I love those structures. I, they're very, very impressive. Um, not built to last, unfortunately, and not meant to last. They were taken down after the World's Fair because they were just basically steel and gypsum. But what neat buildings those were. And there was a Crystal Palace at the 39 and 40 World's Fair. 
was sort of a bar and a performance area in the amusement section of the 1939 and 40 World's Fair, but there it is directly homaged at that point. Now, later on, of course, this is the Botanical Gardens, uh, the New York Botanical Gardens in the Bronx, and you can see all the way back, tracing back to Joseph Paxton's idea of creating these greenhouses from glass and metal. And of course, we see these in a lot of botanical gardens, although Skylands does not have one, unfortunately. And of course, the Javits Center, which, say what you will about it, is definitely an homage to the Crystal Palace. Very, very impressive in size structure. But I will leave uh, you with two notes one of which was uh, one of America's most popular poets, Walt Whitman, was uh, when he had a season pass to the World's Fair, he was obsessed uh, with the Crystal Palace. Uh, and he wrote a whole poem called Song of the Exhibition that was in uh, Leaves of Grass. And he wrote these words, around a palace loftier, fair, ampler than any yet, Earth's more modern wonders, history's seven outstripping, high rising tier with glass and iron facades gladdening the sun and sky in hued and cheerful hues, bronze, lilac, robin's egg, marine and crimson, over whose golden roof shall flaunt beneath the ba that they banner freedom, the banners of the states, the flags of every land, abroad a, of lofty fair, but lesser palaces shall cluster. Basically saying, this is now better than any of the seven wonders of the world. Uh, and I love that he puts in here, again, something that doesn't really get written about, the color from the dome, bronze, lilac, again, uh, golden. So the light coming through the dome would have been more golden than it would have been clear sunlight because of the metal on the dome. Horace Greeley would go on to uh, try to affect as much change. There are two statues of him in New York. One, this one is right by City Hall. Um, he will also become part of the Liberal Republican Party. And in 1872, he will try to run for president, but Ulysses S. Grant will beat him. Um, and he will die in 1872. And he's buried right next door to me at Greenwood Cemetery here in Brooklyn. But he really was an agent for social change in New York. And um, one of the things that uh, we leave behind is the idea that all of New York really is a crystal palace. A lot of exhibition, a lot of show, and um, there it is. I will leave you with that. I hope you enjoyed, and I will be happy to take any questions you have, hopefully be able to answer them. Uh, I'll drop my screen. <clears throat> Thank you, Justin. That was excellent. That was really a wonderful oh, presentation. So My pleasure. My pleasure. Um, Open it up to questions now. If anyone wants to type in questions in the uh, Q and A box, we'll be uh, happy to take them. Any relationship between the Crystal Palace and then the uh, what was it, the sixty nine uh, or sixty four World's Fair? I don't think so. That you know, the sixty four World's Fair was a whole different beast. It actually wasn't even a World's Fair. Um, we called it a World's Fair, but Robert Moses. I'm assuming well, you're AIA, so I'm assuming you guys know Robert Moses. Uh, he he did not appeal to the International Exhibitions Bureau. Um, they they told him they wouldn't give him uh, the license to be a World's Fair, so he went okay. on his own sort of tangent and did his own did thing. his own thing. Yeah, it does kind of have the Unisphere going with the steel cage and yeah yeah, and I know, mean the but... Unisphere. It's interesting. I have a World's Fair tour on Sunday, so I'm in the mode. Um, <laughs> Unisphere is the largest representation of the planet Earth on planet Earth, and it was the third choice for the fair designers, but it is, um, it was a marvel of, uh, architecture because of it's on the 112, uh, degree axis that the Earth would be on, and they had, like, supercomputers needed, uh, to be used that were, like, the size of rooms to get that right so it sat on the pedestal without Perfect falling way. off it's an amazing i mean the unisphere is an amazing structure but it is uh um the trial on in paris i never made the connection between the observatory and the dome until i saw that uh when i was doing research for this it's really kind of neat was that a postcard or uh yeah it was a postcard so i have a lot of um ephemera from the world's fairs to put together the tour and then what happens is uh people see that I do the tour and they send me stuff. <laughs> so somebody sent gotcha. me a postcard 
um, that was in their like grandmother's collection. And I went, holy crap, this is the, this is the Crystal Palace. Uh, it was great. All right, any, any questions? I haven't seen any come in yet. I mean, again, Justin, I thought it was just a phenomenal presentation. So oh, thank, thank you so thank much you, for it. You. It was yeah. really wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, it was my pleasure. I love to talk about it because oh, I think one came oh, Here's our first one. Yeah. Okay, from Arthur. You referenced at least three times a civil medal, silver medal for an award. It sounded like it is the highest achievement in the respective categories. My question was- Yes, I apologize. Yeah, no, no, I apologize, Arthur. I, I, I did this the, uh, the first time I gave this presentation to our insiders. Somebody said, well, what was the gold medal? And I'm like, ah, there was no gold medal. No, silver medal at that time was considered to be the standard. Um, I believe it's early 20th century Olympics. Uh, I think it's the early 20th century Olympics, which will introduce the idea of a gold medal. But I, I know there were gold medals in a lot of other competitions in the late um, 19th century. But for these exhibitions, the British one uh, in 1851 and 1854, the silver medal was the highest prize you could get. No silver point. and bronze, those were the only two. And I always forget to clarify. Sorry. Thank you, Arthur. <laughs> Any other questions out there? Uh, so, oh, hi, Faye. Uh, good question, Faye. Um, so Faye asked, why is the time frame slash history, or maybe she meant what is the time frame uh, history of the Croton Reservoir? So uh, Croton Reservoir was conceived in the 1840s, again, as I said, to bring fresh water to a, a city that really needed it. I mean, we were really sort of uh, starving for fresh water. And uh, if you were rich, you could buy water, but if you weren't, you were basically doomed to whatever awful diseases were coming from the water. So uh, 1842, they opened the first Croton aqueduct. Uh, the High Bridge is built. So High Bridge was really New York's first bridge, not the Brooklyn Bridge. And um, they run the water 30 miles down and it can bring to New York 100 million gallons of water a day, which of course kind of blows your mind just to think of that, but it wasn't enough because one of the things is by 1880, they introduced the flushing indoor toilet. Uh, so they had to build a whole new reservoir system. Uh, so they improved the Croton Reservoir in the 18, I believe it was the late 1880s. Uh, if you've ever been up to upper Manhattan in the Morningside Heights area, there are a bunch of old pump houses or gate houses, and those were put in in the 1890s to get access to the new line. By the 1890s, they had already drained the Croton Reservoir out on, in the 40s, and then eventually it will get replaced in the early 20th century by the library. They didn't need it anymore. They didn't need the reservoirs. So Alberto's question about the reservoir, was that between 40th and 41st Street? Yes. Uh, so uh, 42nd. Uh, yes, between 40th and 42nd. So uh, the south side of the library starts on 40th and goes to 42nd, and that was the exact footprint of the reservoir. And again, okay. if you go, if you're in the city and you're ever interested in seeing a remnant of it, go right into the library, go downstairs. I believe it's the east side staircase. You'll see there's an old uh, Croton Reservoir wall. Yeah, Anthony's asking here, how much of it can you see from within the expanded public library under the park? It's, uh, it's, it's almost, you're basically in the stairwell. So it's, it's the size of the stair. It's like a landing in, mm. the, in the stairwell. It's not a lot, but it's enough to be cool. <laughs> Actually, if you, uh, if you go to our web, if you go to Untap New York and um, type in Croton Reservoir, you'll see an article with a picture of it. Um, did you want to explain about how the uh, oh, right. memberships yes. okay. work, so, Justin? Yeah, sure. So those of you who are joining us tonight, uh, thank you for coming, by the way. Uh, what I do as Chief Experience Officer, not only do I do uh, in-person tours, but we, during the pandemic, started uh, virtual uh, tours, which became a big hit. We have a global audience, and we decided um, it might be nice if you guys are interested in talks like this. We have a lot of programming. Uh, a lot of which I lead, but we also bring in authors, architects uh, on a weekly basis. We do at least two to three programs uh, through our insiders. Also, if you guys come into the city post pandemic frequently, insiders also get access to in-person events as well that we are doing. 
Um, as a matter of fact, we are walking over the high bridge in May um, and other great stuff, uh, Greenwood Cemetery. We are giving you a, a complimentary month free. Um, what's gonna happen is within the half hour, <laughs> you're gonna get an email. Um, we've whitelisted you. What you have to do is you have to confirm your email address with us. Uh, you're gonna see it says Untap New York, uh, well, Insiders Untap New York. Just confirm your email address and then you will be given access into uh, the Insiders menu. And actually what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put in um, the link to the Insiders website so you could take a look at it. Now that link is only good a half hour after you get it. So watch out, I'm gonna tell Nicole now that we are uh, wrapping up and she's gonna send them to you. So it should come to your inbox uh, any minute. And then just all you have to do is confirm your address and you'll be signed in automatically uh, as an insider for okay. a month free. And we are not, um, it's a trial membership but there is no credit card information uh, behind it. So it won't start charging you like some trials do. Uh, if you like what you see after a month and you'd like to join us, please do, but you'd have to enter your uh, credit card information. So I put the um, link in there. Also, I'm gonna put uh, the email address of me and Nicole at Insiders uh, in case you miss the time frame but still wanna join. It's insiders at untappedcities.com. Just email us with your name. Your, your email addresses have already been preloaded in. So all you have to do is give us your name. We know your email. And um, yeah, we'd be happy to take it from there. But what you'll find when you go to the Insiders is we do a lot of talks like this, a lot of in-person events now that we're uh, coming out of the pandemic. They're small size. And um, you have uh, our video archive as well, which has over a hundred talks and uh, tours in it for you to watch if you'd like, so. Wonderful. And uh, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about it or the process, I'd be happy to uh, help you through it. We have another question here from Alberto. Uh, how deep was yeah. the reservoir and was it lined with stone or concrete? Uh, it was, how deep was it? So I think it was uh, three stories deep uh, and concrete. I believe it was concrete. Gotcha. Basically it was, um, it was granite on the outside and I believe it was sort of like a tub, a concrete tub uh, that Renwick designed in um, that, again, that Egyptian Renaissance style, which was not very popular back then. It was a really neat looking building. Good question. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, hope to well, see I think that you, wraps uh, it up. Justin, yeah. thank you so much for yeah, the talk. I, I know I personally enjoyed it. And uh, thank you to everyone else who joined us tonight. And uh, I hope everyone takes advantage of the uh, trial membership. So, yeah, please do. It'll be fun. Okay. It'll be fun to see you. Um, thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, uh, AIA. And uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll see you up at the uh, the botanical gardens. My dad and I. Will be <laughs> there <one>. you go. <laughs> Have a good Thanks one. Thanks so guys. much, Have Justin. Thank Have you. a nice evening, everyone. Bye. Thank you.